Hey everyone, welcome to the Tom's Hardware Show for June 25th, 2020. I'm Abram Pilch, our Editor-in-Chief. Uh, with me today, I ha as always, I have Senior Editor Sharon Harding, and today we have Senior Editor Andrew Friedman. Okay. How are you guys doing? Good. I feel like I never left. <laughs> I feel like you never left. <laughs> so, um, uh, so you, so you got, uh, before we get started with today, this week's topics, uh, you guys have any, have any major pro, any major projects that you're, that you're working on that, uh, that you can share? Um, well, I am in the middle of testing, um, some new switches from Kale. They're called Kale box red switches and you'll, you'll get to see them a little closer in a little bit, but, um, they're um, they're pretty new. Um, they aren't actually available in any keyboards yet, so um, I actually had to install them into a keyboard myself. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, I guess. Yeah, in the, in the past, yep, sorry, and yeah. then in the past week or so, we've had a few sort of high-profile systems reviews go up. I, mean, I wrote up our the Corsair Vengeance A4100, which is a Ryzen and, and NVIDIA-based streaming system that has a capture card inside which won our Editor's Choice Award. And then we also put up, our colleague Michelle Earhart wrote about the Asus ROG Strix Scar, which has been updated with 300 hertz screen and is also really impressive. And you should check both of those out. Great. Well, I got uh, an ongoing project to test a bunch of chargers, but uh, I want to show something kind of fun, which is uh, this robot Ooh. that my son and I, my eight year old son and I are building. It's uh, it's based on the body is uh, Pimeroni or they like to call themselves Pimeroni uh, STS uh, robot body, which comes with the wheels and the motors. And then there's a Raspberry Pi four attached to the top of it, and the ex uh, Pimeroni Explorer hat. This week we put up a list of different Raspberry Pi hats, and uh, this is. Uh, our top choice hat because it lets you do all kinds of cool things like put in um, like attached motors and sensors and things that uh, you can't easily do without attaching a hat, which is the code word for an expansion board uh, for La Raspberry Pi. Um, and uh, so we put this together last night and we still have to install the software to get it working. We also have to attach a camera to the front. Uh, I have to say, this was a little bit of a challenge just because of how tiny all the little uh, nylon screws are. And you have screws and bolts and the bolts are all white and then and the screws are all white and you have to make the bolt go through the, the screw through, go through the bolt. And it's like, I, you know, you need like perfect eyesight or, or a microscope to make sure you got it through, but I did. So uh, uh, that's why you do it with your son, right? Small fingers, tiny child yeah. hands. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really like this thing. Uh, I do think it's pretty cool, and I'll, I'll probably be writing about it, though it's been out on the market for a while. But the thing, uh, the thing that get the the thing though, I wish they gave you more than what more than the minimum amount of screws that you need because I kept dropping them on the floor, and I was like, oh man, if I can't find this. I'm done. I, I uh, yeah, I, I feel you. I accidentally like flung an M2 screw across my apartment the other day. I still haven't found it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, also, I feel you. also, now that my daughter has started to put my one-year-old has started to put things in her to her mouth, I don't want to drop anything on the floor anywhere. Um, well, if she can find my M2 screw, I can finally put it in the motherboard. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. I'll send her over to your apartment to look for it. The other, there we go. She's gonna eat it, Andrew. She's not gonna give it to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. She hasn't really shown an interest in eating eating uh, metal things. But <laughs> yesterday, she took a giant bite out of a Nerf ball. Like you know, she was just walking around chewing, and we're like, "Hey, what's in your mouth?" And then we see she had taken this Nerf ball that someone had given us, and there was like a big chunk bitten out of it, like an apple. Anyway, so uh, keep those screws away from your small kids. Anyway, and so, your Nerf balls. And your nerf balls, apparently. So, um, uh, so this week was a pretty big news week, uh, yes. to be sure. Uh, lots of product announcements at the beginning of the week, and one that was not unexpected, uh, but uh, Apple gave some more details about its desire to switch uh, to ARM-based processors on its PC, on its, can we call them PCs, on its computers. What's a computer? Uh so Andrew, uh, you've been following that that news. What uh, what did we learn this week? 
Sure. So Apple, which has been making its own processors for a while now for the iPhone and the iPad, is now going to take them, which are their ARM-based processors, and finally put them in its Macs. So we've never seen anything running Mac OS running it before. Now we will. This will ultimately, over the course of two years, uh, CEO Tim Cook said, replace Intel. And so they're going to have a few more Intel releases come out, but ultimately the plan is to only use what they're calling Apple Silicon. And what, so Johnny Sruji, who is the head of chip design there, he showed this chart um, at WWDC, which they've done virtually this year because of the novel coronavirus. And it shows, look, you have these notebooks that have low power consumption and low performance, or these desktop chips that have high power consumption and high performance. Our Apple Silicon is going to have low power consumption and high performance. So they're suggesting that by sticking with ARM and tuning it for their next version of Mac OS, which is Mac OS 11, so stepping away from, from OS X officially completely, and Mac OS 11 Big Sur, that they're going to be able to make things run faster, they'll have more control of the platform, and they'll be able to run I, uh, iOS and iPad OS apps natively. So what? Uh, so do you think uh, this is going to give them a performance advantage or, or a battery life advantage? So I would I would say the battery life advantage is probably where we're, we're more likely to see things initially. Um, ARM battery life is is designed to be really good. But the thing here's the thing: Sergi and no one else at Apple have really given us firm benchmarks. If they're saying low perform or low power but low power usage seems to be the big thing they're pushing so that would suggest that they might blow some windows laptops out of the water in terms of battery life in terms of performance they showed a few things one of them they showed they showed uh i think it was shadow of the tomb raider running at middle to high settings and running through emulation so that's fairly impressive but do we know if, are they running a discrete gpu is it their own gpu which they also make for the iphone or ipad in terms of performance that's just going to get really interesting because Right now, they're running on x86. They ran on PowerPC before that. And developers now have to do the work. And this is why they teased a Mac at the end of the year. They don't usually do that, because developers have to do the work to recompile their apps for ARM. And they're, they're going to have a few ways to do that. They're shipping out developer kits now, which are going to be Mac minis with the A12Z Bionic. And that's the existing one in the iPad Pro. And they're going to assume if it's strong enough for this, it's going to work on what it will probably be a MacBook. Pro is the next one. and But there's going to be a question. Are they going to, are developers going to be able to get their apps ready in time? They showed that Microsoft's already working on having it running native for ARM. They showed Word. They showed Excel. They showed PowerPoint. They said, look how fast Word, Excel, and PowerPoint are. And then they showed a lot of the Adobe apps. They showed Lightroom, and they showed Photoshop. And honestly, that's kind of a coup because you know if you use it like a Surface Pro X, you still can't open Lightroom well, like because they're doing it all through emulation. So having those big apps natively is a big deal. But otherwise, they're going to use what they're going to call Rosetta 2. Rosetta is what they use to emulate from PowerPC to x86. This will emulate from x86 over to ARM instruction sets. And the question is, how well is that going to work? And the answer is, we don't know yet. So they didn't really make claims about benchmarks or even like what any specific chip designed specifically for the Mac is going to look like. And the one thing we may is that we may not know it for a while because those developer transition kits with the iPad chip in them, uh, the developers have had to sign, you know, they've had to sign things that say, you, I can't benchmark on these. I can't take pictures of benchmarks on these. I can't write, I can't draw diagrams of benchmarks on these. So it may be a while before we see how Mac OS goes. Mac OS Big Sur is only in beta, but there will probably be a weird mix for a while of emulated apps for x86 and universal apps that are compiled for both ARM and x86. But the fact that they're going to keep making Intel Macs for a while, they said they're going to keep coming even this year. It will be, we'll probably, if I had to guess, totally speculate, is we'll probably see some sort of Tiger Lake Mac at some point. That, huh. they're be that they're going to be supporting both for a while, that Intel Macs will continue to get updates. And so at least over these two years, I'd expect longer because Apple's usually really good about updates. But I mean, there's also a question outside of the, the Mac space. So Microsoft was looking at ARM, right? They had the SQ1, which was a variant of the Snapdragon 8CX in the Surface Pro X. And I mean, Windows 10 on ARM is it's slow going, but it's it's a thing to be to be charitable. ARM's gonna gain 
they're going to gain mind they're going to gain mind share in this case right so like even though they're only like five to seven percent of intel's business or apple is like five to seven percent of intel's specifically client computing business not the entire business so like huh. it's a few it's a few billion dollars there but you know they're going to get they're going to get mind share there things if you look back at like the macbook air that was something transformative that others ultimately followed and i wouldn't be surprised to see others once if they see if this works and it works well and they see it take off are others going to want to turn to arm 2 in their laptops is windows 10 on arm going to get you know another life and that's what i'm really curious to see as well ha huh. sharon would you feel confident using an, a, a computer pc or mac with arm processor in it today <laughs> I mean, like one of my questions actually is um, with that switch to ARM processors, are Macs going to get any cheaper at all? Um, like it's the same problem like that you have with AMD competing with Intel. The name Intel is very well known. I think people do have heard of ARM, but not in the way they've heard of Intel. And um, I think it's, it will be a hard sell for a lot of people. I know a lot of people who buy Macs, who buy MacBook Pros who don't need them at all. They just know that Apple Apple products last a long time and it has pro, it has the highest specs. There are a lot of people who buy Macs like that. And so to, I mean, Apple will probably market their CPU as what being the best one, right? Of having low power consumption and high performance. But um, I think um, they're gonna find a lot of that same obstacle that um, Intel has made a name for itself. Intel has been this the brand for a while for mainstream computing and the, the switch to ARM, I think a lot of people will just um, not be so familiar with them. And especially with Macs, because they're so expensive. A lot of people don't want to take risks with that amount of money. So Johnny Sruji and Tim Cook and Craig Federighi and all the people over at Apple, if you watch the WWDC stream, it was really interesting. They never used the word ARM once. It was always Apple Silicon. So you're, I don't think they're ever going to use the word ARM. Maybe they'll put it in the tech specs on their website. Oh yeah, we're using you know ARM cores or something like that. But beyond that, they're they're not using it in their marketing. And I think that's really smart. No one outside of you know enthusiast computing really knows what ARM is. They do know what Intel is. They do, they might know what AMD is. Those are big company names. They have big stocks. But in terms of this, they're they're saying this is Apple. Like you're getting Apple stuff. And I think for those people you're describing. All right, good. I'm getting the Apple stuff. Like that, like yeah, you said, they're buying the pro levels well. and, and don't need it. For for them, it'll go well unless they open up a bunch of applications and they say, "Why the hell don't these work?" <laughs> but yeah, so that's how we'll see how emulation goes. Yes, I mean Windows on ARM, uh, from my perspective, has been a disaster. Like it, it was a nice idea that you could have some competition for Intel and AMD, and you could potentially have, uh, you know, lower power consumption by using Qualcomm chips, but we've seen a bunch of these always connected PCs come out and the performance, even on the latest ones that we used was meh at best. It really needed to run, it could run 32-bit um, 32 32-bit Windows apps, but it really needed the special Windows Store apps that were compiled for it to run well. Right. Uh, and there was just a lot of, a lot of issues and then you're paying the same amount of money if not more to get them so so what is so what is the point i mean i guess the point was you were supposed to get somewhat better battery life and right. and you had built in built in 4g now possibly built in 5g but it's not like you can't get a laptop that has an intel chip uh or possibly an amd chip that just has an f4 or 5g modem in it it's not impossible to do that so I so far I haven't seen great uh, great strides there. I know, uh, you know, I know the the companies that make the ARM processor, particularly Qualcomm, because Qualcomm is the one behind really the always connected PCs. There's right. no other brand uh, of ARM processor doing it um, that you know would would like it to do well. But at the same time, they've been very expensive, and and you don't get even as good. You, you have a thousand dollar laptop. That doesn't perform as well as a five hundred dollar laptop. Like that's not that's not yeah. cool. I'd, um, I'd imagine some sort of renewed push. The other thing about Windows on ARM that's particularly interesting is that Macs have famously been really good about like about dual booting. They have something called Boot Camp, the Intel based Macs, I should say, and you could install Windows on it. And for a very very small portion of the Mac community, 
often, you know, developers, things like that, they might use some tools that you can't get on Mac and they would do a boot windows there. It sounds like they're getting rid of that, that that is gone, that they're going exclusively through virtualization now. And they showed on WWDC, okay, here's some virtual Linux, here's Docker. They haven't shown Windows yet. I think a lot, there's a bunch of people wondering, oh, is that, are they going to make a version of Windows on ARM that'll run natively on Apple Silicon? But no one said anything about it yet, so we're going to have to hope that there's a version that works through virtualization, and that'll be really interesting. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a, quite a possibility because there is Windows on ARM. The problem is that you can't download it. it you have to buy a computer right. that has it. Yes, yeah, currently OEM only. And we someone have in the, yeah, in the I chat. want to say someone in the chat room wants yeah. wanted to know uh, if they only have to ask questions about what we're talking about. No, but we'll get to questions that are not what we're talking about at the at the end. But I promise that we will. We always do. We do have uh, one question here. It looks like about this, which is our our ARM chips SOCs as RK two thousand. And if so, does that suggest that future Apple computers will no longer use discrete RAM and storage? meaning all RAM storage and GPUs will be integrated? Um, That's a good question. Apple really didn't answer a ton of questions about what exactly you know a motherboard will look like in a computer that they use. Like there's sort of, it's, it's hard to tell. They've suggested high efficiency, like they had this drawing and is of a chip and it's surrounded by everything. Low power design, high efficiency DRAM, high performance GPU. Is that currently going to be all on the chip the way they implement it in a Mac? No idea. It's definitely the way they do it on an iPad or on a phone is they tend to use the system on a chip. I couldn't guess how they're currently going to do it on the Mac, whether well, it's a laptop or a desktop. With MacBook Pros, since those are not like all those other Mac computers that target creatives, wouldn't they probably need a discrete graphics card to do creative work? Um, Most MacBook Pros as currently branded actually don't, or not most of them, but all the low ends don't have them. They tended to use, or at least the current lineup uses Intel's Iris Plus integrated graphics. It's like a slight step up from the UHD. There are some that get into, they're all, they don't, they stopped using NVIDIA graphics a long time ago. Where they use AMD discrete graphics. And those are like in all the 16 inch MacBook Pros use them, for instance. And no idea, again, like, will they be able to get the existing GPUs to work with their CPUs. Will they end up using their own their own uh, GPU as well? It's hard to say. I, yeah, I, I I don't think we've ever seen an ARM chip that worked with a regular uh, discrete GPU. The GPU is always built into the SOC, as far as I know. So it seems like, but you know, the, the real question is around performance. Like if I think if they want to keep offering discrete graphics uh, perform cards and the performance delta is there, that like people are going to demand it, then they're going to have to keep offering uh, systems with x86 chips. Yeah, that uh, was the big question about the Shadow of the Tomb Raider demo. What was it What was it running off of? What, were they using a discrete GPU or was it integrated? And we don't yet know. Yeah, I can promise you this. Nothing will be upgradable. Nothing will be upgradable by the user. Apple does not like people upgrading stuff. They did not allow people to upgrade their MacBooks in years. Except, and for, the Mac, except for the Mac Pro. And that's going to be a really interesting one. Because right. I've been talking with Paul Alcorn, our CPU guy, a lot on this. What ha like, wh how well will they scale up? Because at a certain point, if they're going to do a whole transition, they'll knock out the Xeon in the Mac Pro. And then we're going to have to be talking about a Xeon level ARM chip that works in a computer that is modular, with, that they do sell more RAM or storage for. And that would be, in, and use external GPUs. That would be really interesting. Yeah, that that would be a real issue. So let's talk. Let's talk a bit about some of the other stuff that was announced this week. Uh, we finally got. You know, we all were sad that we didn't get to go to Computex, which is the big tech show in Taiwan uh, that happens last week of last week of May, first week of June. We were all there last year at this. Oh, well, not this time. All there last year at the end of May, but. Uh, uh, a lot of the announcements that probably would have been made at Computex were made this week. And there was a lot of great new, interesting new gaming gear, including a slew of new gaming monitors and gaming PCs. Sharon, you got to spend some time with uh, at least one of the new gaming monitors. What do you think of some of the new screens that are coming out? Um, yeah, so the one I um, got to spend a few days with is um, the Acer Predator XB 27.3 UGS. Um, so it's a 27-inch uh, QHD monitor, 
And we've actually seen a few of these announced lately, um, taking the 1440p resolution and the 27H form factor. And we've seen a lot of IPS panels um, announced with those specs this week. So the Easter I just mentioned, um, and also the Dell. Um, so in terms of performance, um, with the IPS panel, you get better viewing angles. So it was great to share. I watched Mission Impossible Fallout for the 20th time on it with a friend. I was able to share the screen. And what's interesting about this is, um, for if you look at our best gaming monitor recommendations right now, um, our 1440p recommendation um, is actually a VA panel, but we're seeing more IPS um, options, which gives you uh, better colors usually and better viewing angles. So it just gives you um, better options. And the IPS panels, not always, but um, they can often reach a faster response time. So the Predator um, that I checked out, and you can see our hands on um, on the website, it actually has a 0 0.5 millisecond response time, which is crazy, crazy fast. And yeah, we're just seeing, all, um, especially with 1440p monitors, we're seeing a lot coming out this year and they're not uh, particularly cheap. This one I reviewed was about uh, $500, but they're, the 1440p monitors are getting more accessible and we're getting more options and different panel types. So it's cool to see. Um, besides that, I didn't get to try this monitor out, but um, Acer actually announced that they are going to be coming out with the 360 hertz monitor, which is insane. Um, if you're unaware, I would say like the typical gaming monitor is at 144 hertz. So 360 is just wild. Um, so this is actually the third one announced this year. None of them are out yet, um, but they all kind of have similar specs, um, 24 and a half inches in size. Um, and oh, sorry to mention the three that are coming out. So um, Acer just announced one. Asus has the ROG Swift 360 coming out and Alienware also announced one. Um, they're all 24 and a half inches. Alienware confirmed they're using IPS. Nobody else has. Um, I suspect they might all be the same panels, be coming out with different feature sets um, and logos and um, prices and things like that. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, I think a lot of people are ready to move from full HD to QHD and if anyone's still at 60 hertz, um, 144 hertz is becoming more affordable. Um, but the 360 hertz, a lot of people, like in a lot of games, you're just not even gonna be able to hit 360 frames per second unless you have um, a very powerful graphics card and you're playing like an esports game at lower settings for like AAA titles, like Battlefield Five. like you're not gonna get uh, to 360 frames per second. So it's really like, there's a small need for it right now, but it's still really, really cool to see things getting faster. I just don't know if anyone really needs it right now. And there's no pricing, so who knows who can afford it, if anyone. If they end, we don't have release dates either, so. Yeah, so Andrew, I know uh, there were a number of new gaming gaming laptops and desktops also announced. What, what were some of the highlights that you're looking forward to? All right, so like Sharon, we mostly saw announcements from Dell and Acer. And I guess what's interesting about on the gaming side is how much has it changed. For the most part, they're using very similar designs, both Dell and Acer. And I mean, I don't know if that's due to just the product roadmap or if that's something to do with COVID manufacturing. The one big new design is in the Dell G G7. Um, that laptop is getting thinner. Um, they're, it's going to have a hinge sort of in the center. If you see pictures of it on the site, it actually looks fairly sleek. Both the G7 and um, 15 and 17 will start at 14, 29.99. The 15 inch will go up to RTX 2070 Max Q. The 17 up to RTX 2070 Super. Both will go up to Intel Core i9. Um, where the other thing they had was the new Dell G5 gaming desktop, which we reviewed and we largely liked, except that the, the cooling situation isn't there and amazing. Isn't but it doesn't look like they kind of took that to heart. The big change they made besides bumping up to Intel 10th gen and the latest RTX supers is that there's a stripe, like a diagonal stripe right across the center of it. And that used to only be blue. Well, now you can pick between a whole bunch of colors. So I guess that's kind of nice. On a Sioux side, they're refreshing their laptops. There's a new Helios 300, Helios 700, Triton 300, and Nitro 7. The desktops, the Orion 9000, still not coming to the US, still looks pretty dope. I hope they change their mind on that someday. Um, new Orion and a budget Nitro. What's interesting from Acer though, I think to, to me anyway, is that the, there's a new Swift 5 and they didn't say Tiger, like Acer didn't say Tiger Lake, but they did say next gen and XE graphics. So, you know, put two and two together, Tiger Lake. 
So we do have an idea of the, like, okay, this one's going to be $1,000. They're not saying if that's I-5, I-7, but we're getting an idea of like what a Tiger Lake system might look like. And that is something really thin and light, which I suppose is what we expect. And we know that's coming in October. So I suppose that gives us sort of a back to school-ish timeframe for some Tiger Lake systems. So at least we're getting some view there of something that's, you know, not just, oh, okay, the, the refresh of the current stuff, but looking to the future. Yep. It's, uh, I mean, it, at least we're starting to see some interesting things. Right. Spe speaking of stuff that's interesting and having it your way, like now you can have it your way with more RGB. So there's never enough, there's never enough RGB. I think, you know, I was looking around to maybe get like a new lamp for my house and I was like, can I get an RGB one? Like, and, and I was like, oh, but it's only 256 colors. I don't know if that's enough RGB. Um, <laughs> If anybody wants to recommend an RGB, uh, you know, t bedside lamp for me, uh, I'm I'm all I'm all ears. Uh, speaking of having it your way, there's nothing quite like having a keyboard that you can customize. And Sharon has been working on something that I've long wanted to do, and she's got to do it, which is putting in your own keyboard switches. So how we have an article from her going up shortly about how to do this, but tell us, show us how, how did you do it? How do you manage to, to change your keyboard switches and, and why would someone who, who hasn't heard of this before want to do it? Okay. Yeah. So there are a few reasons why you would want to do it. And I kind of hinted at one of them before, and that's if um, there are a lot of switch types out there, but they're not all readily available in pre-made keyboards. So if there's one that you wanted to try out or that isn't available in a keyboard, um, you would have to buy the switches on your own and put them in a keyboard. And that includes the kale switches that I am um, in the middle of reviewing. So there are a couple of ways you could uh, customize your own keyboard. And one of them would be to build it from scratch. Um, that's a very involved process where you'd have to buy your own uh, frame and PCB and stabilizers and all that. So. But if you wanted to do it um, in a simpler way, you can buy what there are a few names for it. But you could buy a hot swappable keyboard. Um, I've also seen them labeled as modular keyboards or hot swap keyboards. Um, so I have one here. This is uh, from the brand Gloria. So it's about a hundred dollars. You could find different priced ones, uh, some cheaper ones. Logitech is probably the most mainstream brand um, who has one. Uh, they have the G Pro X. That's about one fifty. Um, so yeah, these keyboards make it easy to take out the switches without um, soldering, which is what you'd have to do if it wasn't hot swappable. And you could also do it with the keyboard plugged into your computer to make sure that the keys are working after you do it. So I'm gonna try to do it on this keyboard now. So bear with me, I swear it's easy, but because I'm gonna try to do it live, it's gonna go horribly. So, so my keyboard came with a keycap puller. You might have even gotten a non uh, hot swap of a keyboard that comes with these. They're pretty cheap. And the key is to like get the arms underneath the keycap so you don't scratch it, like literally underneath it. So I'm gonna try to pop one off. And I like to take all the keycaps off um, before I start taking off the switches because it just makes it easier in the end. So boom, look at that, I popped that all off. And so this is the kale. Uh, they call it the box red switch. I know it's pink, but <laughs> so that's that's the one I already installed. But here is the gator on brown switches that came with the keyboard. And here's like another reason if you want a different feel and different keys. Um, some people like a stiffer space bar, for example. I've reviewed keyboards that come um, with that configuration already set up. But if you wanted to change the feel for different keys. So here I have a tactile key or a tactile switch, I'm sorry. And, and my keyboard is linear. So if I wanted to go from linear to tactile. And then, so here's the uh, switch puller that came with the keyboard. As you can see, this one's metal, and this is, you really wanna make sure you don't scratch your keyboard with these. And again, the point is to get it in um, underneath the switch. There are two tabs in the switch that you're probably not gonna be able to see, but they're on the top and the bottom, and I'm gonna squeeze them in. And the tr trick is you're just supposed to be able to pull it straight up. So if you're getting resistance, when you're trying to do it, then you can start over and just make sure you're not being nervous and messing it up. <laughs> so then, like I just pulled it straight up, and then now I'm going to put in the new one. And again, there's some there are two pins in these. You want them at the bottom. You want them straight. If they're not straight, you could uh, bend them with your fingers. 
I had some that were actually like flattened. So I took them out with tweezers or I unfolded them with tweezers and you just wanna jam them straight in and you'll hear the click. And then just for fun, I'm gonna put on a new key cap on here because you could do that. And there you go. I mean, it's upside down, but you guys get the picture. Actually, wait, hold on, I'm gonna prove to you that it works. And I'm not lying to you guys because people don't lie on live video or on YouTube or Facebook. But look, it's working. I did it. It just took a second. Woo! Ta -da. <laughs> uh, see, that's that's awesome. I really want to get, but I have not found one, a terminal size keyboard, like one with extra keys. I'm not into 10 keyless or 60% keyboard. I want extra function keys where I can put some of my favorite switches in it. Right now I'm using a keyboard that has Kale box white switches, which are my favorites at the moment. Uh, and I would love to get one where I had like another extra function row or something like that. Cause I feel like you can just never have enough buttons, never enough buttons, never enough RGBs, never, never enough. Uh, but that, that is why, that is why that is so cool is that there's so many switches out there. Like what are what are your favorite switches right now, Sharon? Um, yeah, so I I prefer tactile ones and I also prefer clicky ones. And here's like another thing, if you want to get a switch tester before you commit to any, you can grab one and then you could try them all out. So I'm a fan of the blues, which is here, and you could probably hear the click if I'm annoying about it. And it's it's just fun. I actually grew up using typewriters, so that was my original typing experience. So it's close to that feeling um i appreciate um so yeah i'm i'm, I'm a i'm a cherry blue girl <laughs> how about you andrew yeah and so the keyboard i typically use is a, Cor a corsair use uh, corsair mark ii uses cherry blues and i came from some cherry reds and i thought for a while because i was using a gaming keyboard and i was using it also for office work oh you know do something quieter but the blues just feel so much better and i mean i've I also like the razor greens. I have the razor turret, which I use at home because this couch I like to play from sometimes. And I got to say the, the razor's greens are pretty good sometimes. So there are some, there are some non cherries. I'm not a purist that I do find really nice, but I definitely prefer the tactile ones, even if they make noise. Like I remember moving, like coming in, okay, we're working from home for a while and just being told like, wow, like you type very aggressively. I'm like, well, yeah, but it's also this keyboard. <laughs> One week of working in our office, and I oh. realized like I am not loud typing at all. <laughs> like, yeah, like yeah, no, no, so no doubt. The symphony no, of plastic hitting metal. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, my current favorites are are clicky, also the kale kale whites, which are, which are, um, which are the which are a little bit shorter travel than the uh than the blue so you can type a little bit faster i find i can type a little bit faster but they're also uh pl plenty loud and they definitely have a, still have a lot of travel i'm still trying to, to wanting to try out some of the other tactile switches that are out there that i haven't gotten to type on yet like the kale jade and the kale navy which is supposed to be a little bit heavier green i found cherry green to be a little a little too much resistance razor green i really like um, so now that's just us. We know there's a whole lot of people out there who like the quieter brown switches. And we know there's a whole bunch of people out there who like the linear red style switches, especially for gaming, because it's, it's, you can fire faster, I think, because there's no, nothing stopping you on the way down. Uh, but the beauty of it is if you can swap your own switches, you're open to a much greater palette of switches in the world. Cause there's like dozens, hundreds of them. But when you go to buy a pre-made keyboard, there's only, you know, there's limits. There's not a, a, as many different kinds of switches available to you uh, if you are just buying a, buying a pre-made. Um, that's why Sharon is testing out uh, these new, these new Cherry, uh, are they, not Cherry, I'm sorry, these new Kale, they're Kale Box Red. Yeah, yeah, yep. The new Kale Box Red because you can't get them on another, you, you right now you the, we don't literally don't know of any keyboard that comes with them pre pre-installed so um you know that's uh, but i always feel like an artist has to have their tools right you've got to have the best keyboard 
because having a, a, a keyboard that feels right to you is the, is something is you're going to use it all day every day. Uh, so we've gotten to the that point point in the show where we want to take and answer people's questions that we didn't already. Uh, does anybody have any questions that we didn't or comments that we didn't already address? I know somebody asked about arms on SOCs and somebody in the chat room asked about whether they should use DisplayPort or HDMI for G-Sync. But I see that Jared has already said yeah. that he recommends uh, DisplayPort. Uh, so um, I have a question while we're waiting for yes. people. I kind of like subtly asked it before, but I'm curious. Um, do you guys think the um, Apple Silicon will help the price of Macs go down since they're, you know, developing it on their own? I'm seeing a no. <laughs> I say no. Yeah. I, I don't know. We, we, they did like make the, they've made the prices somewhat more reasonable recently in some areas, you know, you can get a MacBook air sub a thousand. They've reduced the prices of some, some base storage, um, I, I don't know. My initial guess would probably be no, but while they're releasing the Intel ones, it would be interesting to see how they market their own chips versus the Intel ones at the same time. I mean, in theory, they'll probably save some money in the long run. They don't need to pay Intel for these chips anymore. Once they get it down to a science, they'll probably be making money on them. They could, in theory, pass those savings on to the consumer. We haven't historically seen that happen, but it's not impossible. Well, as long as Apple is making money, that's all that matters. Yeah, right? yes. their their margin will their margin will Im improve, and I think that's why they're doing it. Like they want Apple wants first of all, eventually they'll they'll probably make money on this. Second of all, they have more control over the process, and a lot of people, of course, have been disappointed with Intel uh, in the last few years and their issues with ten nanometer and, and getting to a die shrink. So. Apple probably, you know, Apple really wants to control its own destiny. And, and so that's, I think that's why they're doing this. They want to control their own destiny. There may be uh, some efficiencies here to save money for, uh, but that's only to increase Apple's margin. Apple continues to see itself as uh, I think most people see it, a premium brand. And so they don't go for budget and it's odd to me, but I always thought that when you bring a new thing to market, particularly something that's suspect, like I'm going to try to, to give you an ARM processor when you've been using x86 for all these years, you show a little bit of humility with the pricing. Like, hey, wait a second. We have to prove to people that we're as good as the x86 they're used to. So let's, you know, let's try and, you know, convince them by making things a little bit cheaper. But that seems to, that, but that seems to never happen. I mean, I mean it's that, with, that's not an Apple thing. You saw the Surface Pro X wasn't, right, wasn't cheap. Right, exactly. not, not, yes, no new technology it, is ever cheap. It, it, exactly. But it's not like it's new technology. I mean, I would have thought, for example, when the Surface, original Surface came out, the Surface RT, which was eight years ago, something like that, uh, that had ARM. And that also had a lot of issues. And yet it was more expensive than an iPad. And, and I thought at the time, hey, they're trying to compete with Apple. They're trying to show people... Hey, Microsoft, we're a new player in the hardware space. You know, we're going to come in here with some humility and maybe you know try to beat them on price. But no, they didn't. They didn't do it, even though it turned out that those original surfaces, surface tablets that used ARM, had a lot of issues and people didn't like them. But you know, still, uh, they they didn't cut the price. So, and we've seen the same thing with these uh, always connected PCs, right? I would have thought that considering that they can't run all of your apps, that they have to emulate a lot of stuff, that these always connected PCs that were coming out with the Qualcomm chips would be would be a bargain, uh, especially because phones, you know, I mean, phones are not cheap, but I mean, the processor part of them is not, is probably not the reason why your flagship phone is $1,000. So like, why, you know, why is it so expensive? I guess they feel like, hey, we're not, we're not going to try and convince people people to buy our product by lowering the price, uh, by trying to undercut on price. Now, AMD used to do that. Uh, and I guess in some extent, to some extent, AMD in some areas is still, uh, you know, cheaper than Intel on a better value than Intel on certain things. But as you've seen, uh, the stature of AMD grow, uh, I think you, you've seen the price differential for, for things like AMD powered laptops and, 
NAMD power desktops really, really shrink because they don't have to try and convince people, hey, buy us because we're less expensive. And releasing a new technology and saying, oh, like we're going to make it cheaper. So you, you buy it like that is either it, it a kind of shows lack of confidence. And B, how do you raise it up after that? If if Apple were to say, oh, okay, look, here's our new MacBook Pro, and we're going to start this one at the price of our old MacBook Air because we want to show this to you, people aren't going to want to go back in two, three, four, five years and then pay $1,200 for it. That's just not how it's going to work. And Yeah. And I, mean, I was just not, hoping they would pass the savings on to us, but why? Yeah. That one, was really one, a one could having, hope. The, having control of the chips means they could potentially make a wider variety of processors at a wider variety of price points that meet exactly their needs. Like there's, there's just so much we don't know. Like the fact that it's happening is such huge news that we talked about it for 20 minutes, but there's still so much we will know by the end of the year that we'll probably, we could have this discussion all over again in my guess, September or October, November, and know a lot more. It could be the new Mac keyboard too, right? It, I, I mean, these chips could be the equivalent of the Mac keyboard. What could happen? What could happen here is they could come out with this. Not to be an naysayer, but I must be an naysayer. They could come out with this, and people who are like hardcore Mac people, creative professionals who are used to do using Adobe and um, you know Adobe Suite and things like that, and they're not getting the performance that they want out of these ARM chips or out of the ARM versions of the applications. Uh, they could look at it and say, hey, Apple, we know you wanted to push the envelope just like they did with the keyboard, right? Apple wanted to push the envelope on the keyboard by making it more flat because they thought, I guess Apple thought that having like regular travel keys was somehow old fashioned and they wanted to be, you know, more new, you know, more high tech or something. Uh, and it wasn't as usable. So I think there's a decent chance that uh, this it, this is problematic, at least out of the gate in terms of performance. And yeah, how do they scale it up? Because for Apple, if you're Apple, you want to have one platform. Like that's right. In fact, that's part of what they're doing. They're going to get to have the same CPU that they use in their tablets use in their, you know, they're going to have to use the same type of CPU in their tablets as they use in their PCs. So how are they how are they going to do it when you really want someone who's doing like professional 3D animation and you know working for a movie studio doing special effects? Are they going to do that on an ARM chip? I mean, they what might. I mean, we have we have we haven't seen what they, we haven't seen what they've announced yet. So Some, sure someday you, maybe the, the biggest super the most powerful in the supercomputer in the world is now running ARM chips. I mean, it was designed to be a supercomputer, but which just to say we don't know. I. I don't want to say it'll work out of the box, but Apple's developer community is pretty, pretty darn loyal. I'd say yep. far more than Microsoft. So the fact that they have Adobe like working on it is much more than Microsoft had. I think they're like, oh yeah, we're gonna have Photoshop working eventually. So what it might work, it might not work. But I do think that this is this that looking towards ARM is gonna be a big thing for every laptop and even some desktop vendors and there's going to be a big fight on Intel and AMD's hand to keep x86 the dominant process. Yeah, no doubt. Well, we haven't really gotten any any more any more questions, so I'm going to say uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, for those who tuned in live, uh, for those who didn't, thank you for thank you for watching and listening. Uh, for Tom, for Tom's Hardware, I'm Avram. I'm Sharon. I'm Andrew. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.